Welcome to the Tudors Dynasty podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, owner of TudorsDynasty.com, and welcome to the extended series on Queen Elizabeth on the show. As I've stated on Facebook, I've been having a difficult time finding redeeming qualities in adult Elizabeth or Queen Elizabeth. The purpose of these episodes was not only to share with all of you, but to open my own eyes on the woman, the queen that I've had little interest in. My interest has always been with her father, Henry VIII. I've been more interested in Elizabeth's childhood than her reign, and that's mostly because of my fascination with Thomas Seymour. This series on her is a selfish one, one that will show me something about the adult Elizabeth that I was unaware of. Now, let's talk a bit about my podcast. If you're new to my show and found me on iTunes, you're missing out on a bunch of episodes that came before I integrated with iTunes. If you're interested in hearing all of them, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty and click on posts. I also have a link to them on TudorsDynasty.com in the menu. If you find me on iTunes, I'd love to see some more five-star ratings and comments there. The more reviews, the higher I will be on recommendation lists for other Tudor lovers. My podcast originates on Patreon, and I do things a little different than most podcasters. My episodes tend to be 30 minutes or less, while most podcasters do an hour. If you're like me, you don't have time to listen to an hour podcast. It's because of this I've chosen to do a shorter one. However, when I do large topics like Queen Elizabeth, I end up having way more episodes than a standard podcaster would. I hope you don't mind. It also takes a really long time to research, write, record, and edit a 30-minute episode. And it gives me a whole new respect for those that do an hour-long one. Speaking of Patreon, I need to take a moment to thank my existing patrons. Without your support, I wouldn't be able to continue with these podcasts. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's not only my podcast that you support, but also my website, TudorsDynasty.com, which started in June of 2015 as Tudors Weekly. This was a paperly account where I was able to share all kinds of Tudor-related topics with those who found my page. A few months into it, I realized that I had ideas of my own for articles that I wished to write, but I never considered myself a writer. I really only knew that I loved the Tudor era. With the support and encouragement of my husband, he convinced me to start writing. He said, the more you write, the better you'll get. I wasn't sure if he was right, and I was terrified for the reaction that I would get from social media, but I did it anyway. And I was pleasantly surprised by the response I received. At the beginning, there were no critics who picked apart my articles or scolded me for bad grammar. That didn't come until later when more people discovered my site. In 2016, I decided to switch from Tudors Weekly to Tudors Dynasty. I was posting articles way more than once a week, and using Dynasty seemed to convey more of what I was doing. It stuck, and now I'm known as such on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook. But let's be honest, if you want to stay in contact with me, and see more social media posts, it will be on Facebook. Lately on Facebook, I've decided to focus on one person each month. In November, I focused on Katherine Howard, and in December, I focused on Queen Elizabeth. This month, I've chosen Katherine of Aragon. When I focus on one person, that does not mean it's all you're going to find in my feed, but you'll find portraits, artifacts, articles, and podcasts on the subject. I've decided to start doing this as a way to build more awareness about some of these amazing women. In the following months, we'll be focusing on Mary Queen of Scots, Catherine Parr, and Lady Jane Grey. For those of you that support my podcast, please know that all the money received from patrons like you go right back into the show, the cost of running the website, and research materials, including subscriptions to hidden or hard-to-find documents. Believe it or not, I have a full-time day job, and this is something that I do in my ever-decreasing downtime. Creating a podcast can easily take 15 hours a week, something that my husband is not too keen about, but it's my passion, and he supports me. You might not understand why I'm so obsessed with the tutors, but he supports me nonetheless. If you'd like to become a patron of my podcast, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com, and click Become a Patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can support the show. Now I'd like to especially thank my current patrons, 
Jessica, Kim, Kathy, Katie, Rachel H., Diane, Joy, Lynn, James, Rachel D., Lacey, Angela, Azaria, Alithia, Anne, Maria, Cynthia, Lisa, Stacy, Nora, Wendy, Frankie, Ramey, Catherine, Carrie, Jen, Heather, Cheryl, Mary, Nicole, Tanya, Astra, and Melissa. Thank you all for supporting my show and all that I do. Before we get started with the show, I want to address what's going on with Facebook. Facebook is changing, and because of this change, you're going to start seeing less posts by me in your feed, if you see it at all. Facebook wants to control what you see. In my opinion, they don't want businesses to get by with free publicity or marketing. This will mean that in order for me to ensure you see my posts, I'll have to pay Facebook to boost it in order for you to see it in your feed. This is something that those in our community, like authors and other bloggers, cannot afford to do. The only way around this is to come to my page directly. So please don't forget about me and my page. Keep coming back and interacting. Also, if you love reading the articles for my website, you can subscribe by email to be notified whenever a new post goes up. I won't send you marketing or newsletters, only new articles. Thank you for your friendship and patronage, and I hope to see you soon. Now let's get on with the show. Sit back, relax, close your eyes, and prepare to be transported back in time to the life of Elizabeth Tudor, Queen of England. By mid-January 1559, Elizabeth had her household set. Rightfully so, she was officially crowned Queen of England. Her group of tightly knit ladies were referred to as, quote, the old flock of Hatfield. Among the ladies who served the queen, there was a new regime in place. Instead of the Catholic ladies in Queen Mary's household like Wharton, Waldegrave, Cornwallis, Babington, Dormer, and Southwell, they were replaced by the queen's cousins, the ladies Carrie, Knowles, and Ashley, as well as the daughters and wives of those men who also served her, such as the ladies Cecil, Throckmorton, Warner, Cheek, and Banger. Of course, the ladies who served her throughout her life would also be involved now that she was queen as well. Cat Ashley and Blanche Perry, to name two. Blanche had been reported to have served Elizabeth from the time that she was in the cradle until she died in 1590. Cat Ashley was almost immediately appointed her chief gentlewoman of the privy chamber. This position was the most prestigious post in Elizabeth's household and gave her complete access to the queen. Cat was nearly always by the queen's side. Even at night, she was right there sleeping on a pallet bed in Elizabeth's bedchamber. Not only was she responsible for the care of the queen, but she was also responsible for overseeing all the other ladies of the privy chamber. Blanche Perry was appointed second gentlewoman of the privy chamber and was also, due to her fondness for literature, the keeper of the queen's books. There were two other ladies from Elizabeth's time at Hatfield that found a place in her household as queen. They were Lady Elizabeth Fines de Clinton, who was appointed gentlewoman of the privy chamber, and Elizabeth St. Low, or Bess of Hardwick. Hardwick, at the age of 31, was one of the oldest members of the Queen's household. Lady Anne Russell was one of the youngest ladies to serve the Queen. She was merely 10 years old when she was appointed Maid of Honor. Elizabeth didn't only show favor to the women who had served her in the past, but also some of the women who had served her stepmother, Catherine Parr. Mrs. Eglionby was appointed mother of the maids and Elizabeth Carew was also given a noteworthy position. Interestingly enough, if you were a woman and were not a member of the Queen's household, you were not welcome at courts. Male courtiers were discouraged from bringing their wives to court because this would ruin the image that Elizabeth wanted as the most attractive and desired woman at court. This would explain why Amy Robsart was not at court with her husband Robert Dudley. It wasn't only that the Queen was jealous of her relations with her favorite, she felt that way about all ladies, save the ones who were her servants. Elizabeth even decreased the number of women who normally served the Queen from 20 to only 11. There were now only six maids of honor, the lowest number of female attendants in nearly 40 years. I've had a few of you ask me on Facebook about the different positions that women held in the Queen's household and what they were responsible for. Here's a little idea. The ladies of the privy chamber attended the Queen's daily needs such as washing, dressing, and serving at the table. The Queen's chamberers would perform more menial tasks such as arranging, bedding, and cleaning the Queen's private chambers. 
If you were a maid of honor to the queen, this meant that you were unmarried and attended the queen in public and would carry her long train. A maid of honor was also responsible for entertaining her by singing, dancing, and reading to her. These girls were supervised by the mother of maids. The ladies-in-waiting to the queen were women who were sometimes connected to the privy chamber and held their position due to their experience or their husband's position at court. When these women joined the queen's office, they had to swear a ceremonial oath. The oath was used to form a bond of allegiance between the ladies and their queen. Queen Elizabeth was very concerned about matters of personal cleanliness by the standards of the day. She was known to take regular baths in a tub that was specially made for her. The tub would travel with her from palace to palace. Elizabeth clearly needed to be clean. If for some reason her tub was unavailable or time did not allow for it, her ladies would clean her with wet cloths that were soaked in pewter bowls. As far as dental hygiene, I covered this in an article once, and author Tracy Borman states that Elizabeth would clean her teeth with a concoction of white wine and vinegar boiled with honey, which would be rubbed on with fine cloths. The duty of preparing the queen each day would take hours, from bathing to dressing and hair, all had to be just right. Elizabeth, like her father Henry VIII, did not handle illness well. In her lifetime, it had been noted that stress caused Elizabeth to suffer from headaches, breathlessness, stomach aches, and insomnia. She was also known to rail against her ladies and doctors insisting she was fine because she perceived illness as weakness. This must have been hell for Elizabeth when she contracted smallpox in 1562. It was at Hampton Court Palace on the 10th of October 1562 that Elizabeth began to feel unwell. After immersing herself in a bath and taking a walk outdoors, which resulted in a chill, Elizabeth took to her bed with a fever. A German physician by the name of Dr. Burcott was summoned to examine the queen. His diagnosis was smallpox, even though she had no telltale spots on her skin. Elizabeth called him a fool and dismissed him. By the 16th of October, the queen was gravely ill. She was incapable of speech and would appear to pass out for stretches up to 24 hours. The royal doctors feared she would die and they sent for Cecil. The queen's cousin, Henry Carey, Lord Hunston, persuaded the humiliated Dr. Burcott to return some report by Dagger, to the queen's side. The doctor ordered that Elizabeth be wrapped in red flannel, laid on a pallet bed by the fire, and be given a potion that he had created. Merely two hours later, Elizabeth was alert and speaking. Clearly, Dr. Burcott was no fool. By her side through it all, until she became ill herself, was Robert Dudley's sister, Mary Sidney. Sydney's case was much worse than the Queen's, and she was badly disfigured by her illness. Her husband, Sir Henry Sydney, said, When I went to New Haven, I left her a full fair lady in my eye, at least the fairest, and when I returned, I found her as foul a lady as the smallpox could make her, which she did take by continual attendance of Her Majesty's most precious person, sick of the same disease the scars of which, to her resolute discomfort, ever since have done and doth remain in her face, so as she liveth solitary like a night raven, in the house more to my charge than if we had boarded together as we did before the evil accident happened. End quote. Mary Sidney is listed as a one of Queen Elizabeth's gentlewomen of the privy chamber, and it makes one wonder if she was the one who attended to the queen because of her closeness to Robert. Surely in the big picture, this did not benefit Mary at all. She and her husband served the queen for many, many years and felt that this deserved more rewards than they had received. When Elizabeth's health was good, her favorite pastime was dancing. She loved to show off her skills by performing such beautiful and complicated dances, such as the Galliard and the Volta. Elizabeth would spend long hours with her ladies rehearsing the steps until they were performed to perfection. In the evenings, when Elizabeth retired to her private apartments, her ladies would attend to her every need. They would carefully unpin her hair, undress her, and remove her makeup. The queen undone was something only her ladies were allowed to see. This is why it was such a big deal years later when the Earl of Sussex, Lettuce Knoll's son, burst into the queen's bedchamber to witness her in the state. To serve the queen was not a lucrative career. It was mostly for the prestige and favor by the queen. 
their pay was considered moderate. Maids of honor and ladies of the presence chamber were seldom paid at all, while ladies of the privy chamber and bedchamber received an annual salary of roughly 33 pounds or the equivalent of around 7,000 pounds today. Not only did they lack pay or receive very little pay, but their meals usually consisted of leftovers from the queen's meals. While most of the women in her household were unpaid or little paid, they were regularly receiving clothes, jewelry, and other gifts from their mistress. Their living quarters were also very cramped and uncomfortable. While the sanitation was poor, there were no bathrooms or flushing toilets available to them like there was to the queen. The court, as a result, would have had a foul smell. When this would happen, the queen and her entourage would regularly move or travel to allow for a thorough cleaning of the palace to have the human waste disposed of before their return. Elizabeth was also noted as treating her ladies very similarly to how her mother had. If any of her ladies failed to perform any of their duties properly, the queen would fly into a rage and punish them with slaps or blows. Author Tracy Borman says in Elizabeth's Women, When one poor lady was clumsy in serving her at table, Elizabeth stabbed her in the hand. And one foreign visitor to court observed, quote, She is a haughty woman, falling easily into rebuke. She thinks highly of herself and has little regard for her servants and counsel, being of opinion that she is far wiser than they. She mocks them and often cries out upon them, end quote. It is said that Elizabeth had the temper of her father and all the charm and charisma of her mother. The downside of being a close servant to the queen was that she controlled your fate. I've discussed this several times, that I find it completely selfish and unnecessary for Elizabeth to hate when her ladies married. One of the ladies who served Elizabeth learned the hard way not to cross the queen. Her name was Elizabeth Throckmorton. In 1584, at the age of 19, Elizabeth, or Bess Throckmorton, went to court and became a lady-in-waiting to Queen Elizabeth. Eventually, she became gentlewoman of the privy chamber. She was responsible for dressing the queen, a very intimate job indeed. Bess and her younger brother Arthur were both courtiers during the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Bess had been described by her contemporaries as intelligent, forthright, passionate, and courageous. After six years at court, at roughly 25 years old, the still single best met Walter Raleigh, who was quickly becoming one of the Queen's favorites. As a lady to the Queen, it was necessary for Bess to get permission to be courted. The Queen must also give her approval of any man who wished to court one of her ladies because they were supposed to be seen as extremely virtuous women. Throckmorton and Raleigh clearly believed they would not get permission and began a secret and intimate relationship. By July 1591, Bess Throckmorton was pregnant. She secretly wed Raleigh and understood the seriousness of getting married without permission from Elizabeth. If she did not marry, then her child would be considered a bastard. So really, at that point, she didn't have a choice. Bess must have been aware of the danger in having the queen discover she was pregnant and married that she somehow obtained permission to leave court to stay at her brother Arthur's home in London. It is there that she gave birth to a son in March 1592. It was not long after she returned to court that the Queen discovered all that had happened behind her back. Both Throckmorton and Raleigh were thrown into the Tower of London. In October, at only six months old, the couple's son died of the plague and Queen Elizabeth chose to release the couple from the Tower. She never forgave Bess Throckmorton for her betrayal and Raleigh was ordered not to be seen at court for one year. The fate of Bess Throckmorton mirrors that of Lettuce Knowles after her secret marriage to Robert Dudley. Both women fell in love with the Queen's favorite, married secretly, and fell from favor. However, both women appear to have found love despite the loss of favor from their Queen. This is something that the Queen would never have. Anne Vafasar was a lady-in-waiting to Queen Elizabeth and the mistress of the Earl of Oxford, by whom she had an illegitimate son, Edward. Both Anne and the Earl of Oxford, for their offenses, were sent to the Tower by the Queen's orders. Later, she became the mistress of Sir Henry Lee of Ditchley, by whom she had another illegitimate son, Thomas. This affair happened shortly after she had married her first husband, John Finch, a sea captain. The Queen apparently was not as displeased with this affair as Anne and Lee entertained the Queen together at Ditchley. 
Interestingly enough, Anne was charged with bigamy when she married John Richardson after she had already married John Finch, who was still living. Her fine was 2,000 pounds, and she was spared from performing a public penance. Frances Walsingham was a lady-in-waiting to Queen Elizabeth and the wife of Sir Philip Sidney. She was the daughter of Francis Walsingham, who was a trusted advisor of Queen Elizabeth. He is best known as Elizabeth's spymaster. In 1590, Francis married her second husband, Robert Devereux, second Earl of Essex. The match caused great displeasure to the Queen, partly because Essex was the son of Lettuce Knowles and partly because Elizabeth herself had a crush on Robert Devereux. Then we look at Catherine Carey, cousin or possibly sister to the Queen. Catherine and her husband Francis Knowles were both loyal servants to the Queen. Francis was always at the will of the Queen, even when his wife was on her deathbed, and he begged to be by her side. The Queen would not allow him to come home. Even Catherine requested her husband to be by her side, to no avail. Throughout my years of researching the Tudors, I've always said that Elizabeth is my least favorite Tudor monarch. And this podcast, in my opinion, is the perfect example of why. I understand those of you who love her because she was a strong female ruler or because she brought peace and prosperity to England. My response to that is, sure, yes, she was all of those things, but that does not mean that she was a nice person. In my opinion, she was just like her father. She was selfish, moody, and unjust. This is where I'll end this week's podcast on Queen Elizabeth. The next episode will be my last, and I haven't quite figured out where I'm going with that one yet. Next week, I'll be taking the week off because I will hopefully be traveling home to visit my dad, who recently had some major surgery, and he's been struggling to recover. I've been a little distracted lately because of this and just hope he gets better soon. Thank you so much for joining me today. Until next time.